If Bidenomics works, IT will be a very big deal. President Biden might not seem like a revolutionary, but he is presiding over a fundamental change in the nation's approach to economics. Not only is he proposing a major break from the trickle-down policies of Ronald Reagan, as Biden highlighted in a speech in Chicago on Wednesday. He is also departing from many orthodoxies that shaped the presidencies of Democrats Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. Government is no longer shying away from pushing investment toward specific goals and industries. Spending on public works is back in fashion. New free trade treaties are no longer at the heart of the nation's international strategy. Challenging monopolies and providing support for unionization efforts are higher priorities. You can trace the break in part to new circumstances and challenges, as National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan argued in an important speech of his own in April. Heightened competition with China and the urgency of dealing with climate change are part of the story. So, is the long rise of wealth and income inequality accompanied by the collapse of many of the country's industrial communities? The breakdown of supply chains during the pandemic put an accent on resiliency and an emphasis on bringing home manufacturing, for semiconductors especially but for other products, too. The shift also has to do with who Biden is, his long-standing alarm over the Democratic Party's alienation from working and middle-class voters and an unease with the Reagan-era economic consensus that hovered over Democratic administrations. When I worked for him as vice president, Sullivan told me earlier this month, he would frequently talk to me about his underlying discomfort with some of the prevailing economic assumptions, both with respect to trade and domestic investment. The confidence Biden and his lieutenants have in the new path is reflected in their eagerness to tout the word Bidenomics, a label the president now embraces after initially being abashed about paternity for a school of economic thinking. The word was splashed across posters all around the old post office as he spoke. As a political matter, Biden wants to show that his signature policies on technology, climate action and infrastructure are working. On Wednesday, he stressed they are producing well-paying jobs for those who have been on the short end of economic growth, Americans without college degrees and those living in places with hollowed-out economies. The address was part of a concerted administration-wide campaign to counter economic unease that has left Biden with middling approval ratings despite historic job creation. A recent Treasury Department report touted a striking surge in construction spending for manufacturing facilities, which has doubled since the end of 2021. Bidenomics has also gone global. One indicator is the exceptional and ongoing debate Sullivan's speech provoked in proposing a new consensus to replace a set of ideas that champion tax cutting and deregulation, privatization over public action and trade liberalization as an end in itself. The old formulas, Sullivan argued, not only failed to address new problems, they didn't work on their own terms. In the name of oversimplified market efficiency, he said, entire supply chains of strategic goods, along with the industries and jobs that made them, moved overseas. The idea that freer trade would help America export goods, not jobs and capacity, was a promise made but not kept. He stressed the need for a modern American industrial strategy and the benefits of moving beyond traditional trade deals to innovative new international economic partnerships. Sullivan advised Hillary Clinton's 2016 campaign against Donald Trump, and the election's outcome provoked a long period of reflection on the anger he encountered throughout the country. As I traveled across the United States on behalf of the campaign, Sullivan wrote in Democracy Journal in 2018, I was reminded again and again how the broken aspects of the American economy were not the inevitable product of disembodied forces like globalization, they were very much the product of policy choices shaped by decades of conditioning. The Biden-Sullivan project amounts to a program of deconditioning. Sullivan told me his speech is really a description not just of my own journey on these issues but also the journey of his generation responding to the shortcomings of the previous approach. Can Bidenomics become an international template for the center-left as Reaganomics was for the center-right in the 1980s? Already, Biden's climate policies have echoes in the approaches of Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese and British Labour Party leader Keir Starmer. Wayne Swan, 
president of the Australian Labour Party and the country's former treasurer, told me he regarded Sullivan's speech as the best economic address in a decade. Rachel Reeves, prospective chancellor of the Exchequer in Starmer's shadow cabinet, referenced it during a May visit to Washington in detailing her own Securonomics, which bears family resemblances to Bidenomics. But Biden is selling his program hard because he knows its first test will be political. The standing of Reaganomics was secured only after Reagan's re-election. The same will be true of the word Biden first resisted and now holds high. If Bidenomics works, IT will be a very big deal. President Biden might not seem like a revolutionary, but he is presiding over a fundamental change in the nation's approach to economics. Not only is he proposing a major break from the trickle-down policies of Ronald Reagan, as Biden highlighted in a speech in Chicago on Wednesday. He is also departing from many orthodoxies that shaped the presidencies of Democrats Bill Clinton and Barack The odds of a Trump coup attempt in 2024 are dropping fast. The Supreme Court's decision in Moore v. Harper on Tuesday is a major reprieve for American democracy. By rejecting the radical idea that state legislatures have quasi-unlimited power to determine how elections are run, the court made it harder for lawmakers to engage in the shenanigans that Donald Trump encouraged to overturn his 2020 re-election loss. But the decision is better seen in a broader context, it's one of many recent developments that show our democratic system is fortifying itself on multiple levels, unexpectedly reducing the odds of a rerun of Trump's efforts in 2024. Along with the ruling, virtually all election-denying candidates for governor and secretary of state in key swing states lost in the 2022 midterms. Congress reformed the law that governs how presidential electors are counted. And the national response to the January 6, 2021, insurrection has been surprisingly robust, from the House hearings documenting the gravity of that event to the successful prosecutions of many attackers. None of this was preordained. It happened because the American people made it happen, and because key actors in our system in both parties took the threat posed by Trump and his movement seriously. The political and legal systems have taken significant strides toward protecting the integrity of elections against subversion at all levels, Matthew Seligman, a fellow at the Stanford Constitutional Law Center, told me, though he added that, grave threats remain. The court ruling, which upheld the North Carolina Supreme Court's invalidation of a gerrymander by the state legislature, largely rejected the independent state legislature theory, meaning state legislatures will not be insulated from review by state courts and the dictates of state constitutions when setting election rules. As a result, a state legislature probably can't appropriate for itself the power to appoint presidential electors in defiance of the choice of voters, as Trump pressed for in 2020. While other constitutional provisions might prevent this, now it would be directly subject to state court review, as election law expert Richard L. Hassan explains for Slate. A caveat, as Vox's Ian Milheiser notes, the ruling leaves the door open 